Hi everyone, I'm trying to get this all set up and work with you uh, via the internet now. I miss seeing all of you, but we'll get through this and uh, hopefully you'll still gain just as much from this type of lecture. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to be doing chapter six now that we finished the quiz uh, for chapter five. And this chapter is called Logistic Regression. And so we'll start in on the next slide and see what that's about. What we're doing uh, is taking nominal data. So as the slide says, uh, almost 80% of the analysis these days involves some kind of nominal or ordinal variable. Uh, many times it's gained from survey information. Uh, so answering questions like which presidential candidate would a voter choose? Uh, is someone likely to purchase our product? Yes or no? Uh, which team's going to win this weekend? Uh, all of those involve nominal variables. We'll keep our data to nominal and not worry about ordinal uh, data at this point. So logistic regression is going to find a way to use ordinary least squares analysis like we did in regular regression, but for a nominal variable. And so we have a technique, uh, and Jump's going to do the conversion for us, where we'll change that nominal variable into a continuous variable. The dependent variable is converted by taking the logarithm of the probabilities of a success. So if we say uh, if somebody purchases our product, then that will be the success. The sum of those probabilities in their logarithm will be the new variable that we'll predict. So this is the math behind that. Again, jump will do the conversion. So one of our first examples in the book uh, is a high-risk auto loan, and we're trying to figure out if a person needs a pastime device on their car. This device will then uh, locate the car if somebody defaults on their loan. So we're looking at these different predictors for that nominal variable, yes or no, they need a pastime device. And so those variables are going to be how much was financed, uh, the number of miles on the car, uh, the APR, the interest rate, the payment amount per month, and the down payment they made, and then an auto zoom variable. So R squared is not going to be uh, interpreted in the same manner that it was in regular regression. Now it's simply a measure that we can compare between different models and choose the one that seems to be most useful. So when I ask a question about how useful is the model, you can simply convert the R squared value. You'll notice that these R squared values are not usually as high as the ones we got in regular regression. The misclassification rate is going to tell us how many observations that were predicted incorrectly. So for instance, here this is saying 17% of the values that were predicted to say they need a pastime device didn't really, and vice versa. They predicted they didn't need the device when they really did. Our hypothesis looks just the same. You take the number of variables in the model, set them all, their coefficients all equal to zero, and HA will say at least one of those betas does not equal zero. If you reject the null hypothesis based on your chi-square test, not an F test, but chi-square, if its probability is less than alpha, then at least one of those variables is a good predictor. Then we'll go in and test the individual coefficients. So you can see here 
that you, again, ignore the intercept. The amount financed has a p-value less than 0 0.0001, therefore it's a good predictor. Mileage is not. APR, payment amount, uh, down payment, and auto zoom appear to be good predictors. Okay, so there's another value that we can calculate called BIC that has to be used along with those p-values for each variable. BIC is simply calculated by taking each chi-square for each variable minus the log of n. If BIC is positive, we're going to say we have enough samples to use that variable. Don't worry about having to decide if BIC falls between 0 and 2, 2 and 6, 6 and 10. We'll just say if it's positive, then we'll keep it as a good predictor. So I've calculated the big values here. Mileage is not going to be good, but all the other variables can be kept in the model. Then we'll interpret the coefficients. This is quite a bit different from what we did before. We'll look at the odds ratio in the jump output. This will give you the amount that the odds of a success changes for a one unit increase in that coefficient, holding all the other variables constant. So you'll have to take the odds ratio minus one to get the value you want to use. Okay, you can get the exact amount of change in odds of a success by subtracting one from that odds ratio. So for amount finance, if we take 0.9996 minus 1, that will give us the amount of change in finance Okay, for one unit value there. So as the amount financed increases by one unit, the odds of a success are going to decrease by 0.04%, holding all other variables constant. If we do the same thing for APR, as APR increases by one unit, the odds of a success decrease by almost 15%, holding all the other variables constant. Then there's just a slight change in the variables for the payment and the down payment and auto zoom because it's just so close to one. The confusion matrix should not confuse you. All you do is add across and get the total for that row. So when we use the model, this says that there were 589 instances. When we said no, they don't need the past time device, and no, they didn't need it. So we were correct 589 times out of 617. All right, then for the yes row, there were 48 instances where we predicted yes, they needed the device, and yes, they really did need the device because they defaulted on their loan. That's out of a total of 152. So that ratio works out to be 95.5% for the no's and only 31.6% for the yeses. All right, so our errors are not randomly distributed because there's such a big difference between the odds ratio for the no answers and the odds ratio for the yes answers. When they're far apart and there's no rule of thumb established, but when they're really far apart, like the difference in 95 and 31 percent, then we're going to say they're not randomly distributed. If they were close, say 95 percent and 85 percent would be okay, and we would say they are.